If you enjoyed this episode, please support this podcast by going to talkmurder.com slash join and becoming a Taco Supremo. Hey, John, Jeremy here, and I have an unbelievable but absolutely true story request for you tonight. So there's this guy from Canada, of course, who has never farmed a day in his life, but has the brilliant business idea to move to an isolated chicken ranch out in rural California. At first, everything runs pretty smoothly for this lad. And besides a few mommy issues, I would say he's doing pretty decent out there. But as the weeks start to pass, the chicken poop starts to pile up in the chicken coop. And naturally, this guy starts getting a bit lonely and... Well, I don't want to spoil it for you, but I probably should mention that like Jekyll and Hyde, this farm boy has two sides. One, a charmer, and two, a sadistical, sex-craving maniac who kidnaps young boys, tortures them for weeks before chopping them up like splintered wood and tossing them into the California desert to let crows pick at their eyeballs. Seems like this story is right up your alley. Chicken, chicken nuggets, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, wow, that's super catchy. All right, guys, that is uh, the Chicken Nugget song by Nick Bean. You can find that on YouTube there. And I know I'm going to get some responses from that one. But enough clucking around. I've got a great episode for you tonight. So let's get started. What was it, Rooster? Was that the hint? Chicken Coop. Chicken Coop. So Jen found us a cocktail called the Red, Red Rooster. Rooster. Close enough. So it's mostly cranberry juice um it's like three th- about three ounces of cranberry juice about a half ounce of orange juice and then like an ounce and a quarter of vodka it's quite lovely mm, mm-hmm. it is good mm. the hint is chicken coop so nicole where are we going and who are we killing tonight i believe we're going to kentucky this evening and i believe this is another Farm cultish story request from Steve. I think that someone gets locked in a chicken coop and is held hostage. That is frightening. It is, but it's it's better than being killed by chickens. Oh, I thought that's also where you're going with it. Like they, I was they pick them out. I, like <laughs> ah, initially, isn't that's that it. in a movie where like a chicken like pecks them to death? I don't Some know. Horror movie. I don't know. It, probably. There's so many stupid horror movies out there, like Rubber. Have you heard of rubber? No. Yeah. Is that the tire one? Yeah. That's yeah. that the talk I was talking about. But no, but I... I, I it's actually this. pretty good. Surprise shot. Surprise shot. We don't know what they are because they're a surprise. What the fuck? This is like two shots here. It's a shooter. <sighs> but it's, it's definitely not a shooter. You do not put a cherry in a shooter, dude. Just what the fuck? Okay, ju- just try that to is, good. Try to filter it through your teeth. So Can you don't I guess choke. before? Go for it. Is it the Firefly Cherry Moonshine? Ding ding! All right, drink up. Tonight we have a very special episode for our Taco Supremo and good friend Steve. No, almost Steve, but almost Steve. <laughs> <And> <laughs> almost. One of our other few men. <laughs> yeah, one of the other man men, Jeremy. What oh, up, Jeremy? Jeremy. You guys Long remember? Time no here. You guys remember Jeremy? Of yes. course, <clears throat> Jeremy, one of two. Hey, Tyler. Also, so both Steve and Jeremy are known for requesting amazing stories. Jeremy requested the Axe Man of New Orleans oh, story, yes. which that I was asked, a good one. which I loved to cover, and that was mm-hmm. a great story. Mm-hmm. And I think he requested another one too, but I'm not sure what it is. Do you think that if I went under a pseudonym and requested a story, you would find out it was me. Uh, are you going to pay $47 <laughs> to join the membership? Because if you do, I don't give a shit. You can request a story, but as long as you pay. <laughs> oh, 
Must pay dues. <laughs> you're you're actually Jen. You're the only one that's on auto renew. By the way, <laughs> I took everyone off auto renew for next year, and I left Jen on. So you're the only one that's getting charged. Wow, thanks. <laughs> wait, John. wait, hang on. I have a house I'm, payment now. I can't I'm pretty that. sure it's under my credit card. Oh, <laughs> what the fuck for? Because everything's under my All credit right. card. Jen, you need to go to your account and put your credit card in there okay. so we can get this settled. You need to pay your dues. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, shit. Jeremy says, the Wineville chicken coop murders is a crazy story, and I think the team could do a great show on it. Keep up the great work. There is a book written called The Road Out of Hell, written by a family member, which oh, cool. is the book we're reading tonight. It's Ooh. by Anthony Flacco. Wait, what? his family member or a family member of the murders? I'm what? assuming the murders or murderer. Oh, I don't know. I didn't go into his. He actually didn't leave an author's note. It's kind of weird. Hmm. Now that I think about it, he didn't actually introduce himself as an author like authors do. But it's a really good book. And if you want to read it, my only words for you is you got to st- Stick around because it develops a story that develops really slowly. But once it hits it, its peak, which is right in the middle of the book, then you won't be able to put it down. But it is so if def- I open it and go to the middle and read from there. <clears throat> yeah, it's definitely a struggle to get through up until the middle. So it's like the roller coaster going up, and she's like, "God damn, why don't you kill somebody?" But then when he finally does, it's like fucking crazy. <laughs> Let's get to the meat. I mean, of that's matter. what I think about when I go on roller coasters. So Nicole is our third place geography B here on the show. <clears throat> um, yes. We couldn't afford a a actual winner, so <laughs> 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 Nicole, please tell us, Wineville, California. What are they known for? Wine. No, it's actually chickens. We're doing the chicken well, coop what murder. what the fuck? Wine <laughs> <laughs> it actually is not even in wine country. Is that, it's not in Napa? <laughs> Are those the Purdue chickens? No, that's in Indiana, right? Uh, um, if you're new here, we put all the pictures that the girls are going to be seeing tonight on talkmer.com, so make sure you go there. Guys, we're looking at Google Maps right now. You see Los Angeles. We're going right here. This is Wineville. So it's almost at the Mexican border. It's pretty far down in California. So here we are right here, Wineville, California. Now, during the time we're going to tonight, we're going to the Rolling Twenties. This is before Black Monday. Nicole, can you please tell us what Black Monday is? Um, It's when the stock market crashed. Oh, shit. Uh, October 29th, 1929. That sounds... Damn right, Yeah, it Jen. does sound right. I don't know if it's the 29th of October. It is. I think it is. All right. We she are... was so confident in that answer. Like, man. Well, that's because, you know, I am intelligent sometimes. Tonight we're going to March 1928. This is in Wineville, California. Who you're looking at here is Walter Collins. Do you want to guess how old this guy is? Eight. I was yeah. going to say nine. Yeah, nine. He's nine years old. This Wait, kid right here is nine years he old. He looks very polished in his pinstripe suit. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Is this the story? I know this is the chicken coop murders, but is this the story that inspired that movie with Angelina Jolie where her kid went missing? That kid's name was Walter Collins. Mm-hmm. The movie you're talking about is 2008's The Changeling. Yes, The Changeling. So who you're looking at is nine-year-old Walter Collins, and we're going to start tonight's story Reading from the book, a narration of how the events went down for this murder, because this nine-year-old boy does get murdered. Hmm. And again, this book is The Road Out of Hell by Anthony Flacco. A little primer of this story before we start reading. You have one sadist serial killer in this story, and he has an accomplice. Mm Mm-hmm. His name is Sanford Clark, the accomplice. Now, the accomplice is a lot younger, and he's not really an accomplice per se. He's got uh, Stockholm Syndrome. So he is getting the brute beatings, but he has Stockholm Syndrome. So he's, you know, his captor, if you will. Mm Kind of like the DC sniper. That's exactly what I was thinking. Did you guys know that Patty Hearst lives in Charleston? The one who had Stockholm Syndrome originally? No. Mm-hmm. She lives in Charleston. Hmm. I just talked to him, Stuart. There was a rants and pause. You you went out to my locked shed, did you, mother? Lock nothing. Don't you forget who paid for this farm. 
Oh, I've watched you sneak out there more than once. Got curious about my boy's special interests. You always have some interesting little projects. And then you keep the keys over by the mantle? I thought that was an invitation to meet your new boy. That kid, Walter? Oh, don't tell me you believe anything he told you, Mother. He lies every time he opens his mouth. He's as useless as a piss hard on. A piss hard on? You're joking at a time like this? It it was no joke, Mother. You should have seen it. (laughs) No, really, though. Uh, What did he try to tell you? He tried to tell me that he was sorry. Sorry, Stuart. He kept on saying it. Sorry. 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 He said his mother told him you seem nice. Oh, and he wants you to know that he doesn't care that you don't have a pony. Jesus, Stuart. A pony? <laughs> All right, mother. I, I know that I know how this has got to look to you. Stop right there, son. I've turned my back on your special interest year after year. We moved our family out of Canada and hope that you leave your special interest behind. My advice and my protection has kept you out of jail because of your special interests. Now you've rewarded me by taking a risk with somebody who knows you. He doesn't know me, mother. He's got a mother out there who you met. Did you get stupid on us, Stuart? Did you do that? Sanford could only watch in horrified fascination while Uncle Stuart's lower lip began to quiver. Seconds later, he burst into tears and embraced his mother. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to, mother. But this time I, I woke up and I, I realized what I had been doing to him and it was too late. I promise. This is really why you wanted me here, isn't it, Stuart? I don't care how much people ever laugh at me for being sick in the head, mother. I will always love you and I will always be grateful to my sweet mother for all of her help. Well, you better be. I am. All right. The quietest way to kill him is to use an axe. Every one of us will strike a blow on the boy so none of us can ever talk about it. A wordless rush of air blasted out through Sanford's lips. It was all the protest Grandma Louise would stand for. Shut up or you're next. What kind of a boy are you that you don't understand the bond between a mother and her son? Stuart, you pull Sanford along and meet me in the shed. Okay, mother, but what are we supposed to tell the boy? Uncle Stuart asked. Not a thing. He's in there asleep. I stayed with him until he drifted off. So I'll be the one to go out and brain him first. Brain him. <laughs> brain. It'll uh, be an act of mercy for a poor child. A blessing that he fell asleep with me cooing to him, almost like his own dear mother. The next thing he knows, I will help personally deliver him to the arms of the Lord. What does brain somebody mean? Like <laughs> the to axe, axe to the brain. Yeah. Oh, okay. It also means getting... Strange. No, not strange. Getting a blowjob. Oh, really? Yeah, I want to get some brain. It means pushing oh, her head down. Oh, no, no, no. Got it. Got it. Like you're, That's good. That's enough. Your, your Got it. genitalia Got it. actually Got hits it. the brain. Well, for that to happen, <laughs> your genitalia would have to be long enough. Yeah, plus you would have to have some sort of hole, like in your mouth. I mean, because... Baby! Your mouth... Ma- I yeah, guess you can go the, through the no, the nostrils, the soft, the soft yeah, palate. esophagus, yeah, because it does connect up there. But you'd have to like, kinda, baby, okay. All right, tonight we're talking about the serial killer, sexual sadist Gordon Stewart Northcott. That is the son of Grandma Louise that you heard. Mm-hmm. Now, Grandma Louise, his mother, is the one that had the idea of braining him. In the first place, going out there with an axe. That's just how they deal with problems. So I haven't really developed a story yet, but they are on a chicken ranch, a chicken coop in the middle of California. It's almost like desert. They're way out there in the country. They're on this chicken coop farm and they're just completely isolated. And the mother of Uncle Stuart, who is out at the farm, the taking care of the farm, she finds a boy, a nine-year-old boy, locked in one of the chicken coops. And she immediately knows that her son is up to his old tricks again. And not only that, but the boy knows Uncle Stuart. So he's crossed the line. This is the first time he's really crossed the line where, because he's killed before. He's killed plenty before, and you, as you'll see. But this is the first time where he killed someone that the the boy's mother actually let Uncle Stuart 
take him back to the ranch to ride a pony. That was his excuse. Now, this is a chicken coop. There's no ponies there. <laughs> so as you heard, Grandma Louise, like, a pony? Really, Stuart? There's no ponies there. That's how he lured the boy in. But now he's got a problem because the mother allowed this boy, her son, to go to this chicken farm. As you'll see, this boy's been tortured and everything else for a few days now. The mother is the one that says, we got to kill him. You can't just take him back to where, right, you know, you right. can't take him back to his home and pretend everything's going to be okay. As you heard her say, this isn't really the first time this happened. They actually had to move from Canada to California to run away from this. Ah. But they moved from Canada because of his, quote, special interest, which, which was is little boys. Little boys and killing little boys. Little, well, not killing little boys yet, but little boys. He's a pedophile. And a sexual sadist. So the whole family flees from Canada and likes to think they're fleeing from this problem. But in fact, they're just taking the problem with them to another location. (laughs) Yeah. The reason this story has been featured in so many popular culture references is because this guy is pure fucking evil. Everyone thinks that this guy is a monster, man. A Hmm. straight monster. Out of the 20s. It's the roaring 20s. Everyone's having a good time. And this guy is having a grand old he, time. This guy is raping and killing young boys. Oh. 30 or 40 or 50. No oh. one knows how many he's killed out in this shitty ass chicken coop in the middle of nowhere. So the so this particular kid that we're talking about here is this like his final murder? No, it's or? not his final murder. That's the one that I wanted to start there because it's not just This guy, Gordon Northcott, that's really screwed up. It's the whole family. The mother is like, let's brain this kid. Let's kill him. I mean, I mean, think about that. You your mother has just stumbled into your rape victim that you have locked in an old chicken shit house. Mm -hmm. And then she comes back, yells at you. And then her plan is to, quote, brain him with an axe. (laughs) Yeah, a little intense. <laughs> That's what kind of story Jeremy recommends for us. <laughs> I love it. All right, so let's talk about Gordon Northcott, born in Bladworth, Saskatchewan, Canada. He's born to Cyrus George Northcott and Sarah Louise, which is Grandma Louise, which you're going to find out while we call her Grandma Louise in a second. But the picture you're looking at now is when he's 13. But I'm going to show you his adult picture right now. And you tell me this guy isn't evil just by looking at his picture. I'm ready to judge. Go to talkmore.com. I want someone to tell me this guy does not look evil, and I will call you a liar. I'm already biased since we're already into the story, but yeah. I mean, look at this guy. Yeah, Yeah. he looks very maniacal in that. Yeah, I mean, this guy is like the original Ted Bundy with his uh, fits of sexual rages, as you'll see. And his mother is a fucking train wreck. Let me show you a picture of his mother. This is his mother right here. Oh, Oh. yeah. And this is her. It looks like she's in drag costume or something. Or she's just on a farm holding a chicken. Oh, shit, that is a chicken. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I didn't know that was a chicken. That That is a fucking chicken. (laughs) I thought it was a costume. I didn't see the chicken's head. Holy shit. But look at this guy. Look how evil he looks, man. Yeah. This guy is pure evil. In fact, the author... He looks like he's got some issues. Oh, yeah, dude. In fact, the author, the very first uh, line of the book, he talks about how evil this dude is. Gordon Stewart Northcott is one of the worst human beings you will ever encounter. Wow. That's saying something. Especially all the humans that we've covered. So if you watch American Horror Story, you can think of Gordon's character as dandy at the um the spoiled rich kid that was kind of in the circus mm-hmm. season season four freak show i see a man with his arms torn off his insides are outside for all the world to see and this one Oh, that one's easy. A man is stabbing a woman to death her blood is smeared all over the wall it's going to be a very messy cleanup i'm bored What's my score? Mother said you wanted to test my genius IQ. Anyway, Gordon, while he's at a young age, his mother develops an obsession 
with him, with her son. Now, this may be because she actually lost a son at six years old mm-hmm. before. So this is her second son. Okay. Do you, When you say obsessed, do you mean like sexually obsessed? Not sexually obsessed, but if you've seen American Horror Story or if you've seen the show or the movie Psycho, it's Norman Bates' mother, mm. where she's just always... She's hyper focused, hyper focused on him, taking care of all of his needs, spoiling him. And every time he gets in trouble, even with the law or even like this in real life, where he is a pedophile because they fled from Canada because he was sexually advancing and he tried to molest a. I think it was like a nine-year-old or eight-year-old. So, like, instead of time. having him being held accountable, yeah. she was she's just like, "Yes, not my son." Because the detectives come, and when they're in, the, when they're in Canada, the detectives come. That's not my son. You fucking get out of here. You don't know what you're talking about. There's no evidence. He would never do that. You defending know, defending him, always defending her son, stuff like that. So, how old is he at? Around this time, around his picture this, looked awfully young. Yeah, so around this time, he's twenty one years old. Wow. Yeah, so he's he's a, done a lot, Ben. So they basically take him, the mother and the father, and run away from this problem. The whole time, he does nothing but play his piano. Like the whole time, and he wants to impress his mother. So he's like, "Mama, I I found out what I want to do in life. I want to become a a real man, and I want to." make something of myself so i want to be a chicken farmer because Uh at the time there was like a big boom not only that but like in the vineyards Ah. the spaces like that the wine and the vineyards and stuff there was a big boom in that stuff this was uh the roar the roaring 20s everyone's farming and agriculture is huge there's a lot of money to be made and plus the family did have good money to just pick up and run from canada buy a house and a an additional property that's a farm with chicken coops and all this stuff just for Mm. their son to have like a project to do. So does he have a lower IQ? Because in the picture, it looks like he might. He's actually pretty intelligent. So, okay. I was going to say, because if it was an IQ issue. No, it's not an IQ issue. Then that would explain why they would be more apt to kind of try to get away from it and so the son was developing this unnatural interest. Now he's a he's a very smart kid. He's spoiled. He's he's actually a uh, a concert pianist. He's extremely talented at the piano. I mean, he is talented enough to play in big venues. You know, big ten thousand seat venues like what we perform in. You know, for our audience. Obviously. Is he now? It seems like he is aware that he's being babied and he's taking advantage. He's definitely a manipulator. Definitely. It, the perfect example is the American Horror Story. That character plays mm. it so well, mm-hmm. where it's just mommy's boy can never do anything wrong. And then mommy always comes to the rescue. And then the father, his father, George, is like the battered husband. Hmm. You know, he tries to call his son out. And then the mother's like, don't you talk to my son like that. He's my blood, like, fuck you, you know, talking to her husband <laughs> wow, like that. that's intense. Yeah, I mean, she, it's such a weird relationship that they have. It's not sexual, but she's just so protective. She favor, because she lost an, a, another son, she, like, favors her son and values her son more than anyone else in the family. Yeah, so this is the farm right here, and this is a pretty cool picture that I found. It's kind of like a, uh, it's, the out, it's the outlay of the farm, and they have little comic Hmm. bubbles, you know, what you see in a comic book, and it Hmm. shows where the bodies are. Pretty cool. So from this point on, I'm going to call him Uncle Stewart, Gordon Northcott, the killer here. I'm going to call him Uncle Stewart, and you're about to see why. He gets out to this farm. He starts with all these chickens, and they're trying to actually pay the farm off. They're trying to make money with this farm. You know, his dad's already put up all this money and everything else, you know, whatever, for this farm. And... His son's only mission is to try to make money with these chickens. They're going to try to raise these chickens, sell the poultry, sell the eggs, do whatever to Mm -hmm. make money out of this farm so they can start bringing some money in. John, you have farm blood in you. Are chickens more profitable than cows? It all depends 
on the operation, I guess. I mean, if you live right by like Golden State Foods and they ship to McDonald's, maybe it's profitable. <laughs> but you know, a good cow can get you a couple thousand dollars in the auction. So hmm. I feel like chickens and, are are less expensive to maintain because you can have so many of them at mm. the same time. It's more expensive to get a cow. Well, you can get a cow and it'll maintain itself if you got enough pasture for it to graze in. But hmm. I mean, but I mean, like you could have probably like three dozen chickens for the same price. I don't know. That's a good question. A when I was when I was on my grandpa's farm, I never, I never really asked him the economics of how he makes money. I I do know hmm. he had chickens and there were. There were pigs, cows. There was a llama. Was, that was definitely not bringing oh, any died? money in. When? I think he died like a year ago. Yeah. What? No one told me about this. Yeah, we found out last time we were up there. We we're like, "Where's the llama?" Because you know we keep buying John llama things. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they had everything, but I'm not sure. I I would have to ask my grandpa how he made most of his money. I do remember going to cow auctions though quite a bit and selling those things. And I know the cows brought in a lot of money. I never actually saw my grandpa selling any chickens, to be honest. You probably the, just like yeah. get their eggs, and then when it's time to yeah. Eat, so my so my eat. grandparents are subsistence farmers, right? So they pretty much raise the chickens for, for their, their own, own consumption. consumption. Yeah. And Whoa, then, you guys never jinx. It's usually me and Nicole. Gordon starts farming, and guess what? He sucks at it. You know why? Because he's never fucking done it in his life, and he's a spoiled. Teenager, right? That he, he thinks he wants to impress. His he's mommy. read one book. He's read them all, and he <laughs> yeah. knows how to and he's a, yeah. manage a chicken coop. And he's a pianist. There's actually a pretty famous photo of this case where it just shows his hands because his fingers are not like callous, like he works a day in his life. Mm. So it shows his hands. Like they took a picture of his hands. It's kind of weird, you know. But that shows who this is. Like he is a sadist psychopath so think about it right now mommy i figured out what i want to do in life and he's all preppy because they got money what son what do you want to do mommy i want to own my own chicken farm now at this time they already moved from california because of special interest Mm -hmm. why the fuck would this guy want to be on an isolated chicken farm so he has the privacy to go murder people. There you go. That's the only reason he wanted it. So he can carry out his, quote, special interest on all these boys in the chicken farm. And mm-hmm. that's exactly why <laughs> that's exactly why he did it. It's quite the cover. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I he, mean, I feel like he could p- have picked something that made louder noises than just chickens going, Pacop! you know? <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say he was trying to get some <laughs> cock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was trying to get some cock. Some cock. You made the joke twice. That wasn't. He was trying to get some cock. <laughs> See, I, when I was looking up the drinks tonight, I was just going to put cocktail. Ah. Uh, but, uh. So he gets out on this farm. Now, his dad is like, dude, you got to make some mother shit money with these chickens. Like, I'm serious. Make some money. I'm tired of eating fucking breakfast burritos, man. So he figures out, guess what? I can't do this by myself. He didn't want to hire any laborers because that would eat up the profits that he's not even making. Naturally. So he gets this great idea. Instead of hiring laborers and spending all this money, he goes back up to Canada and he talks to his sister. His sister's name is Winnie Clark. Mm -hmm. Now, Winnie is the mother of Sanford Clark. So Sanford, the other character in this story that you need to focus on. So there's two. You have Uncle Stuart and then his niece. Wait, niece or nephew? Which one's the guy? Nephew. And then his nephew, Sanford, like Sanford and son. Mm. He convinces Sanford's mom, which is his sister. You understand? Mm -hmm. Okay. And... He takes Sanford, which is only 12, 13 at the time, and drags him back down to California to help him on this farm. Little does Sanford or anyone else know that this is just going to be a big murder farm, and he has no intention of making any money. He just wants to rape boys. So he drags him all the way down. And also keep in mind that Sanford doesn't have legal papers. So the whole time he's in California, he's actually an illegal alien from 
from Canada. Oh. They actually he actually gets snuck across the border oh. by his uncle. So he takes his niece, what is it, niece nephew. or nephew? nephew? He takes his nephew, drives him all the way down to the shitty chicken coop in the middle of nowhere and forces him to do all this work. Now, as Sanford is about to find out, he's about to see a lot of boys coming in and out of the chicken coop. Was he ever sexually assaulted himself? Nicole, that's a good question. This is from the book The Road Out of Hell. And this is after he's been hit multiple times, thrown on the ground, punched in the face. You'll see at one point his uncle takes hot boiling water and throws it all over his back. It's all kinds of stuff. If you want to read this. Uncle Stewart started out the attack by acting gentle with him. But as soon as Sanford recoiled and tried to move away, he was bludgeoned to the ground and dragged into their tent. Oh my gosh. The unreality of this attack was heightened when Uncle Stewart stripped off his clothing and Sanford saw his naked body for the first time. He looked like he was wearing long underwear made out of body hair that reached from oh. his neck oh to his ankle. <laughs> oh my god, that's so gross. That looks oh, like me gross. in a mirror. Oh, stop. Oh, like a gorilla. In, no, you're not. You are not hairy <laughs> at all. But out here in the middle of nowhere, Uncle Stewart decided to do him like he was a girl, penetrating from the rear. <laughs> Sanford cried out in outrage, in oh, fear, oh. in pain, but the cries were not uncle. an attempt to summon help. Oh my god. Uncle, no, no, uncle, don't do this. It's me. It's your nephew. Don't do this. Ah. He could not get to his feet at all. For a long time, he just lay in a heap on the floor, overwhelmed with shame and steeping in disgust. His rear end was torn and bleeding. It felt as if strips of barbed wire had been shoved into him. So oh, he, God. he is raping his own nephew, who is 12 at the time. He brings his nephew down here, has him on this isolated farm. This kid can't go anywhere. So eventually the nephew starts developing Stockholm Syndrome because the book goes into a lot of details about Sanford and the emotions that he was feeling as someone suffering from Stockholm Syndrome. Mm. So, for instance, he knows what it's like to be raped and he knows what it's like when his uncle gets in these fits of sexual frenzies and he's getting penetrated with all this stuff, including like splintered wood. Oh, God. And everything else. So he is getting all this. So when he sees all these boys coming one by one and he hears the screams, he knows they're going through that exact same thing. He's guilt. He feels guilty that he never said anything to stop. Exactly. It from happening so to others. he also not. Yeah, exactly. So not only does he have Stockholm syndrome, he also develops what uh, psychiatrists called survivor's guilt, where he is the sole survivor because he's not getting murdered because he's blood, right? He's family blood. So he's not going to get murdered. Well, he may. But the these r random boys, which I'm going to get into in a second, were mostly Mexicans, hmm. not even Americans, don't even speak English. You know, we're getting raped, tortured, left in the chicken shit shed for a week or two until they became, quote, a liability. And then he would just destroy them. And, and no one knows where all the bones are buried even to this day. Mm. So so is he choosing the the younger Mexican boys because they're undocumented and just kind of coming to help out for in the yeah. farming even still today well just, yeah you know there's temporary visas and stuff like that well at this time there was no border patrol and all this stuff we got now so the mexican family you know living uh, in mexico would send their child or a couple of their children over to the border to sell produce to the americans which are you know in the roaring 20s and having all this money so he would pick a lot of the victims up which a lot of the victims are unnamed unknown even to this day but we know they're mexican boys eight nine and ten that they were sent by their families to sell produce on the side of the road and that's where he would pick them up. Easy targets. They don't speak any English. Mm -hmm. But eventually, but eventually, Uncle Stewart gets tired of these Mexican boys and starts wanting American boys. And he wants a special type of American boy, a well-fed, well-treated, 
all American type of family mm-hmm. boy. Here, Jen, I even have something you can read. Ooh. Oh, oh, God. Can't wait. Uncle Stuart knew how to make Sanford hold still while he kept on stroking him and stroking him until Sanford's body could not resist, and he spurted all <laughs> over, and Uncle Stuart <laughs> laughed and called him his little darling in a tone of voice that made the name sound like filth. Ugh. <laughs> He ejaculated all over himself. I got it. Okay. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that, John. Thank you for that. So this passage. kid has never done this before, and it's his uncle that's making him do this. All right, so a few months go by, and Sanford, he's not participating in any of the killings. There's multiple Mexican boys coming there, and they're seeing Sanford. So this is the routine for Sanford, and if you read the book, you definitely see this. So he, the- yeah, go ahead. So the mom, no, or Louise, Grandma Louise knows that this is happening. Kind of, not really. She a, she like kind of know. She yeah. knows. She knows. I mean, she, she fucking knows. Yeah, because they she stops at the farm randomly and she sees these random Mexican boys that are here today, gone tomorrow. I mean, sh- she knows that he is raping. No, I, his nephew. Oh, I don't think so. Well, probably. I mean, you know, like contextually, mm. he's got the grandmother kids around the same age. Yeah, the grandmother hates Sanford. You know, oh, so her she gran- didn't her care. grandson. She she didn't care. This this so woman she she is all care. about her son, Uncle Stewart. It's it. crazy. Anyway, this goes on for months. Sanford is seeing one Mexican boy after the next, and. Sanford's job on the farm is the caretaker. He does everything because Grandma Louise says, you better do everything so my son doesn't get one callus on his finger type of thing. So he does everything. He he takes care of the hens, the chickens. He feeds them. He feeds his uncle. He feeds himself. He even takes food out to the victims in the shed so they huh. see him, you know, and they can kind of relate to Sanford, and this is kind of the survivor's guilt, because as you'll see here in a little bit, going back to the the one that Grandma Louise cut up with the axe, the first of the episode, before that happened, Sanford walks him out to the watershed so he can bathe, and this kid is like washing himself after he's been raped. You know, all he wanted to do was go see a pony. Now he's been raped for days by this guy. And he's all dirty and everything because Uncle Stuart likes him clean. So he's washing himself and he's looking at Sanford like, help me, help me. And then, you know, he realizes that Sanford's in this mess, too. And he's also got the bruises and and all this stuff going on. Sanford's just like, just do what he says. It won't be as bad if, you know, if you just go along with it and stuff like that. So he is washing this boy, helping this boy wash You know what I'm saying? So that's a survivor's guilt because he is seeing this happening and he's powerless to do anything. He can't overpower his uncle and he's got this dependency now because he's been raped. And, you know, I guess rape victims do feel this where they just feel like guilty and and filthy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because you let it happen. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. So he's feeling like this all the time. But that's how it feels. And a lot of the Mexican boys initially before he started killing them, he would just drop back off at the fruit stand where they came from because they're not going to go to the cops. Number one, they're not even citizens of the country. And number two, who's going to go and tell the police that you've been raped like as a man like that? You you know, you don't do that. You just keep that to yourself type of thing. I guess a woman would feel the same way, but it's embarrassing. Over the next year and a half, life on the ranch settled into a pattern Sanford tended to the farm and its stock. He was physically violated so often and with so many foul things that nothing was right with him down in his rear end. There was blood all the time, no matter what. His back still ached from the burn Uncle Stuart had inflicted on him. The petroleum jelly he had smeared on it every few days hadn't helped at all. In fact, it seemed to make it worse. Uh, He branded him? Well, yeah, he did. He threw the boiling water on him and stuff like that. Yeah, And he put the petroleum jelly... On his butthole, obviously, but all over his back, which you don't put on a burn. It makes it worse. It, right. It traps Keeps heat, heat in. in yeah. yeah. So you don't do that. But this kid for a year and a half plus has been raped and he was walking funny for a year and a half because his butthole never 
healed back up. Poor guy. Because, you know, if there wasn't a boy out in the chicken coop getting raped, it was him getting raped. And some of the survivor's guilt is crazy. If you read the book, for instance, he talks about the heavy feeling that he starts getting the weight, you know, the weighing on his, the physical weighing that he's feeling like an elephant because of Mm -hmm. the guilt. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they go into is he actually is comforted by the screams of other boys out there because it's not him. Yeah. It's not him. He's in his chicken coop. Now he's still chained up too. He's chained up and living in chicken shit, you know, while, so he can't run away his own nephew, but at least now he's got a few minutes of daylight left. He can read his, you know, his, he was reading like Western books and stuff, trying to get his mind away from all this. And the screams actually were comforting because it's not me. I can not get raped for a while. At first there were Mexican boys and then he started picking up Americans and then he started murdering, which you're about to kind of see the first murder we think, but we're not really sure. Mm. He would take these boys and promise them something like in the the first murder we talked about, he promised a pony ride or a lot of times it's his car because his car is like convertible. Mm-hmm. You want to come and ride in my car. You want to come see the ponies or whatever, just to get them out in the chicken farm. As soon as they're out there, clubs them and then throws them in the chicken coop, chains them up and rapes them whenever he wants to for about a week. Doesn't feed them or anything. Just keeps them chained up and just rapes them over and over and over until he gets tired of them. And then he'll dispose of them. That's what he's doing. Screams punctured his days, three of them, one right after another. It sounded as if the boy screamed until his lungs were empty, gasped in as much air as he could, then went right back to screaming again. The third scream was choked off. There was silence for a few moments. Sanford recognized the sounds that came next. They were from Uncle Stewart. He was in his frenzy now. Sanford knew the frenzy. He knew the boy was being shoved face first into hell at the hands of his own personal tormenting demon. So a lot of the true crime enthusiasts think that this is his first victim from the newspapers called the Headless Mexican. That's what they dubbed it. If you want to read this, Nicole, this is from the L.A. Times and this is uh, October 31st, 2004. This is a recap of the story that happened, you know, 70 years ago. On February 2nd, 1928, Los Angeles County Sheriff deputies found a burlap bag containing a headless body in La Puente Ditch. A male teenager had been shot through the heart with a 22 caliber rifle. Oof. So this was one of the boys that actually defied Uncle Stewart. You know, they were at the fruit stand. He's like, I'm not going with you. Get the fuck away from me type of thing. And he's like, nobody, nobody disrespects me like that. And that's what he shot him. But this is the first time that... Sanford has seen the murder. This is before the axe thing with Grandma Louise. This is before that. This is the first time that Sanford knows for damn well he's murdering people because he hears his uncle's car driving up to the chicken farm, which is like the worst sound ever for him, who's chained up. He hates hearing that sound because he knows he's about to get raped or, you know, whatever, beat down or whatever, scared for his life. And His uncle pulls up and he's like, Sanford. And at this point, he's calling his nephew, quote, my little darling. Gross. I know, right? It's fucking crazy. It's the... I can't really describe this guy, but... Creep. But the Uncle Stuart, he's a sexual sadist, so he will put you down. That's how he functions. He has to have someone humiliated on the ground for him to feel normal. Does that make sense? Like he I has mean, no, I will never feel like that. Well, yeah. But yes, I get what you're saying. If not physically, then at least emotionally and mentally he needs to break you down to you can't go to you can't get any lower for him to feel some sort of relaxation. That's a sexual sadist for you. Anyway, he brings a bucket back to the farm and he's like, Sanford, my little darling Come here, I got a present for you. And he brings the bucket over to him. Sanford looks in it and thinks it's a dead animal, but then he realizes that it's not, and it's that boy's head. Oh, God. If you want to read this, this is from the book. 
Sanford's eyes could no longer assist him in denial. They saw what was truly there. It was not just a human scalp. The hair was attached to an entire head. The head was attached to nothing. Oof. For another second or two, Sanford's brain sent back demands to the eyeballs for correction. But the object kept on being the freshly killed, severed human head of a boy or a young man. The skin was dark, like a Mexican or one of the local natives. But that he could have just been the blood. Yikes. But yeah. that could but that could have just been the blood. So no one knows who the boy was, but a lot of sources think it was Alvin Gothia was the boy's name, but no one can be sure because there were many missing boys. Exactly, many missing boys. This head right here that he brought to his nephew, he demanded his nephew to put on a bonfire for several hours until it cooks down and then he was to take like a uh, a log or something and just sit out there for hours beating the skull because you know it it just the the bonfire I mean let's look at Stephen Avery doesn't get rid of all the evidence there's still mm. bone fragments and there's actually pictures of that I'll show you right now so go to talkmore.com to see these evidence photos of what was left at the farm there wasn't much but they did find bone fragments that was buried and guess who dug all the graves obviously the nephew right Dug all the graves. He even dug his own grave at one point. Oh, what? God. Yes. That's messed up. Yeah, so this is some of the bone fragments here. Wow. This is, like, all they found. Now, this was during the 20s, so, I mean, how are you going to test all this? I mean, you, there's no way to tell who this stuff came from. They know it's human bones. And how did this guy get all these details? Mm. Did he confess? That's a, that's a really good question. Sanford, the nephew, is kind of the uh the singing bird right he's the one that the canary confessed, in the, coal the canary mine. in the coal mine so he did get prison time for this for his role in it but he like i said oh, he that's was terrible he was I a, feel so bad for well him. he got five years but he only served 23 months and he's got a great story after that he actually went from this from getting raped by his uncle to serve in prison time for you know being an accomplice. An accomplice, which at the time, no one really knew what Stockholm Syndrome, I mean, they knew what it was, but they didn't really, right. you There's know what I'm no saying? For it. They were like, well, why didn't you stop all this type of thing? At one point, this this got so bad that his uncle had brought an entire family, mother, oh. the father, and four children, and he was going to kill the mother and father and two of the bigger kids and then rape the oh. two children. And this isn't the first time he brought two brothers to the chicken farm, which we're about to get into in detail. Anyway, after the nephew serves his prison time, he actually goes on, as you see here, go to talkmore.com to see these photos. He goes on to serve in uh, World War II on the front lines, and he was a uh, a highly decorated veteran. Oh, cool. So he actually had a very good success story. The photo you're looking at right now is of him and his unit, and he's this guy, the uh -huh. second row with uh -huh. the, the mustache. So he served on the front lines, you know, fighting Hitler in World War II. He became a success story, even though he had to live with this forever. As you see here, this is his wedding day photo. He gets married. He mm -hmm. tries to put all this behind him, mm -hmm. and he serves honorably. And lives out the rest of his life the best he could. And he died of an old age, I believe in, I want to say like 2004 or something. I have to look that up to be specific. But wow. but his uncle was tried for the murders and was actually hanged pretty relatively quick. It's a, it's still amazing to me how young the, that guy was. Mm. All right, so this is Sanford Clark right here, the nephew mm. at the time. God. He looks like yeah. him. Now, yeah, he does, yeah. He was basically fucked out there. Mm -hmm. There was nothing he could do, especially when you got the Stockholm Syndrome and stuff like that. And where's he going to go? Number one, he's not even a legal citizen. Not only that, but going back to the first of the episode where Grandma Louise is like, now, Sanford, you take the axe and finish him off. All three of them, the mother, Uncle Stuart, and Sanford, the nephew, took part in that. Mm -hmm. So now they're all connected. They've all killed that kid, mm -hmm. Walter Collins. They all took part in that murder, mm -hmm. even though he was forced to. So the whole time, Uncle Stewart is like, 
even if you did go to the cops, you'll be swinging right there with the rest of us because you gotcha. also participated mm-hmm. in this. That's the reason I gave you the head to begin with, because that right there gets you invested in all this. You dispose of the evidence. Now you help kill a kid. So every once in a while, he would bring these boys back. Now, he never really buried them at the farm. That was only a few times. So the bone fragments that you saw in that photo, that was three of his victims. That was it. You know, but he's had 30, 40, 50. No one knows how many because he would take them back and then he would drive them off to the desert. They're basically in the desert and put them God knows where. Mm. And no one knows to this day where all the victims are. You know, they've never been found. But he would randomly bring these boys home. And one time he brought two brothers home and he demanded his nephew to clear out one of the chicken coops for him. It was 12-year-old Lewis Winslow and his 10-year-old brother Nelson. Mm. They were both raped right there together the whole time. It's actually screwed up because... As a sexual sadist, this is what he did. He actually convinced the boys that he was going to let them go. Mm -hmm. They concocted a story. He's like, all right, this is a story you need to tell your parents, the police, if they ask, yada, 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 you ran away. He actually wrote a note, said, hey, mom and dad, we ran away to Mexico. And now they were going to come back to the family and say, oh, we changed our mind. He made them believe all of this stuff. Mm. I wonder if he did that more than once. And then, guess what? The axe, right? Mm. So in the book here, Sanford tells both the boys, listen to me, you have to do whatever he wants. Don't argue with him. Don't say no. Uncle Stewart says he has an idea about how you and your brother can go back home. Now, this is after they haven't eaten for a week. They've been raped. They've been, I mean, he's been like shoving things in them. I didn't get into that that amount of detail. but You alluded to it. Yeah. You guys can go back home. Let's just concoct a story. And if you want to read, and if you want to pick up here where it says we can. We can? Nelson's breath caught in his throat. He started to cry. Uncle Stewart whirled from the incubator table, holding his hatchet and smashed it into Nelson's head so hard that the boy gasped a noise that sounded like, and fell out of the chair. Sanford screamed before he found the words. No, no. And I really didn't explain this very well, but the brothers have been here for a week now, and Ugh. Sanford is their only connection to humanity right now because he's mm-hmm. going through the same thing mm-hmm. of this monster. And now there's hope, there's light at the end of the tunnel. So Sanford is really happy, and he's like, just do what he says. We'll get you out of here. He's bathing them, you know, feeding them, taking care of them. He feels responsible. And then obviously they get hatcheted. And thrown in a, you know, a a grave. So that's that survivor's guilt that he carried with him. Mm. So how he got caught is Sanford's sister, Jessie, which was an older sister. Now, Sanford was kind of a puny kid growing up. So his sister, his older sister, kind of took care of him. She actually started getting letters from Sanford, her brother, and she noticed that, yeah, it was his handwriting, but the words didn't come from her brother. She could tell. The words weren't from him. Hmm. So what the uncle was doing was forcing him to write things like, oh, everything's great. Uncle's taking care of me. I'm becoming a man. I'm working hard. I'm going to school. I'm in the Boy Scouts. All this stuff. And it was just complete bullshit. Hmm. And here's one of the notes you're looking at right here. It says, Dear Jesse and Dad, Uncle Stewart is taking very good care of me. It's hard for me to get the chance to write because so many projects. I mean, this isn't Sanford. Like, the sister knows her brother, mm-hmm. and it's just very short, and it's not him. But it is his handwriting. He, It's almost like he is um, exemplary of his uncle. He's teaching me about how to be a rancher. You'd be surprised at how much skill Uncle Stewart has when it comes to dealing with the other ranchers around here. Like, he's... Like, it's so much about how great Uncle yeah. Sanford is. Yeah. like... This guy ain't that great. Yeah. (laughs) Well, that's how, I mean, the guy's an egomaniac too, you know. So she is the reason that this whole thing stopped. There would have been a lot of more murders if she didn't save up her money, get a ticket, go down to California. And because she hated 
Uncle Sanford. Hated him. And the whole time, even before all this, she thought he was a, just a shit bag. So she basically forces her way on the farm. And then if you kind of read the book, you'll see where Sanford's like, I don't want to talk about it. You know, nothing's happening. Keeping up this facade that he's been in the story that, mm-hmm. you know, the uncle concocted for him. And eventually she's like, OK, I'm here's some money. Get on the next train. I'm getting you out of here because she saw the bruises. She saw the the big scar on his back. She saw his butthole that was not healed for two years. Ugh. He it, like it was sore from the first day he got raped and the w- splintered wood shoved up there. It has never healed because when it starts to heal, he would just get it again, you know. So she's seeing all this. She gives him enough money to get on a train, which he doesn't because, you know, he's got Stockholm syndrome. She leaves. But instead of calling the police, because the police ain't going to do nothing for an illegal alien that's not even a citizen of America. Right. She contacts, which is extremely smart. She's this is the smartest thing I've ever heard. She contacts immigration and says, listen, my brother is illegally in this country. And that and that definitely sparks the government. It's like, oh, oh we yeah. can't have any illegal <laughs> aliens here. It's, it's yeah. like that today. Yes. <laughs> so basically... Once all this shit goes down and the sister ends up leaving, the whole family packs up everything. They just they don't even sell the farm anything like the dad, the mother and the fucking demon child, Uncle Stuart, pack up everything in the car like in the same night and just flee to Canada. Interesting that they would flee to Canada. Everything. They 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 should flee to fucking Mexico. They had a house in they had a house in California and this chicken ranch, and they and all this equipment, and everything, they just pack up the car one night and flee, just like they did in Canada, because their demon seated son has, you know, littered a bunch of bodies all over the farm, and now they know shit's coming down, so they just flee, and obviously they get stopped, trying to cross the border, and voila. They're all put in prison. Ah. The Uncle Stewart is hanged for his special you know, interest. For his quote special interest. And then the nephew is sent to prison. He gets out twenty three months, good behavior, and he makes himself a, an honorary war uh veteran, combat veteran fighting the Nazis. I mean he makes a Did he fight for Canada or for the United States? Uh that's a good question. I don't know that answer. I would guess Canada. I would but... guess Canada. Yeah. That's a good question. I was, you know, I should have looked that up. I um, I'm looking at their uniforms. I actually didn't even think to look that up. Because if he spent so much time in the United States, like if it was car- incarcerated in the United States, then what you're looking at now is where the uh, bodies were. This is the grave. This is the chicken coop. One of the mm-hmm. many chicken coops, and this is the grave that Sanford, the nephew, would dig. I have a question. Okay. The way it is now. Can you serve after you've been incarcerated, like to today? And why do I? Yo, like yeah, thing? fuck yeah! I mean, you could join the army. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let anybody in, dude. When I went through basic, there were there was a guy when I was in basic, and I'm not even like this crazy. On his uh, bicep, the inside of your bicep and the inside of your arm, he had five squares that were tattooed like five squares that were tattooed. Mm -hmm. And then below it, he had the word power. So guess what the squares were before? Mm. (laughs) It was white power. And he just got a tattoo artist to cover up the word white. There were gang members. You know, actually a lot of the gangs, especially the Korean gangs, will send their gang members, their lower level gang members that are, just got initiated or whatever into the armed forces to learn the tactics. Interesting. Yeah, that wow. ha- that happens a lot actually. So, so you and then they'll they'll get out after their five years, four years, and now they have, you know, the experience to go, you know, carry out hits <laughs> or whatever. So you you're charged with a crime, you lose your right to vote, but you can still serve your country. Oh, I don't, I don't know about voting. I, if you're a felon, you can't. If vote. you're a felon, yes, and you can't leave the country. Right. And it all depends on what time we're in. If we're like 9-11, I mean, floodgates open up. 
let's yeah, see how many soldiers true. we can get. You know what I'm saying? Now it's like, uh, do we need a big army right now? Um, I mean, yeah, we always, always do. Yes. Yeah, always yeah. do. No, I'm not saying we don't. I'm just saying. <laughs> no, I know. America's answer will always be, fuck, <laughs> fuck yeah. yeah. <laughs> America. Fuck That's what yeah. makes us the greatest goddamn country in the fucking world. <laughs> actually. Well, actually, it's, th- this country's pretty fucking good. Yeah. I mean, I've we, been to we plenty of shitholes out there. Yeah, we do have it good. But I mean, there are some issues out there. There's obviously. definitely some questionable things. Yeah, I mean, but I think you get that with almost any country you're in. There's always oh. going to be something. You're never going to have the perfect, you know, you idyllic society. There's one thing um, that always has stuck out to me, and I can't remember what I saw this on, but it's like, what is America like from s- studying human behavior? Americans are rated like far and above anyone else in confidence. Hmm. That is fucking true. Like, um, we are fucking <laughs> confident that we're fucking awesome. Which is, makes us <laughs> awesome, man. So that's my story on the Wineville murders. I know it's kind of a spread out story. It's hard to go into detail. And I didn't want to make this more than one episode, but I hope I gave you a good synopsis of it. I, I hope I did a good job, and that was a request from Jeremy. One question. Did anything happen to the mother? Oh, good question. Yeah, so the mother did get prison time. Yeah. Yeah. So Solid. But Fuck yeah. <laughs> the, son was, the son was the only one that was hanged. Good you for know. you. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, so. the, uh, the first time. <laughs> and he was, actually hanged pre- he was actually hanged pretty quick, too, after this happened. That's good. And I mean, he was such a monster. They're probably like, we got to string this guy up before he does anything else. Mm. If I would have did two episodes on this, I would have definitely went into the life of the nephew because I think it's very honorable that he served, you know, World War II like mm-hmm. that and that he turned his life around. Unfortunately, I don't want to make this more than one episode. So I kind of, this is kind of a synopsis of the whole case. Yeah. And I really didn't go into detail. No, but it was okay. Very well, interesting. Um, that's the story. So I hope you guys liked it. Uh, thanks so much, Jeremy, for requesting that. If you enjoy this episode, be sure to hit that subscribe button on whatever podcasting app you use. If you like the story, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. If you're absolutely obsessed with this podcast, want to visit our chicken coop, go to talkmore.com slash join, become a talk host primo, get a badass t-shirt, sticker swag, a lot of love, shout it out all over the place. Tell me what story you want me to do. I'll research it and dedicate it to you right here on the Talk More to Me podcast. My name is John here with Jen and Nicole. And until next time, good night, you lovely, lovely people.